All right, welcome to our very last week. Are we excited? No? I could extend the subject by one week if you'd like. Do we want more, one, one more week? <laughs> Some people said yes. I could ask. <laughs> All right. So we are here at our very last week. Shh. So we had 10 topics of new material, and today we're going to do some revision. I'm going to give you a little bit of general information about the exam, but the more detailed information about the exam will come out later in the week. And then tomorrow, I'm also going to send you um, an email with some information about how to sign up for the audit study program. Okay, so we're going to do a summary and then we'll see what the questions are. If people have got a question written, they can uh, stick it in the bucket as it's going around and I'll answer them. Um, I'm not sure whether, you know, I'll be able to answer all of them. If you're doing finance and you need help with your investment analysis assignment that's due tomorrow, I'm not sure how much I can help, but I will try. Okay, so let's go back to basics. What is auditing? And uh, we focused on looking at assurance this semester. Uh, especially over financial statements. So an assurance engagement is one in which we express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Now hopefully by now we know what that means. So let's break that down. So we know about our assurance engagement from ASA 210. Oh, let me change the thickness of my pen there. Don't like that. ASA 210, we have our engagements. We have our conclusions. Does anyone know what audit opinion covers our audit report? Anyone? Anyone? Someone? What ASA number covers our audit opinions? 700. I think I, I saw somebody say 700. So to that person, who I can see is right there. No, that was you. Yeah, I could see she was going 700. There you go, all right. So our conclusions come in ASA 700, designed to enhance the confidence, right? We're adding credibility to the information. Who are our intended users? Shareholders. Shareholders. Who's that up the back? Okay, I won't throw because I'm terribly worried about, you know, receiving a litigation claim for... Hey, all right. So my intended users, and I'll do it in red, the same color, are my shareholders. Okay. And our users could be shareholders, governments, etc., other than the responsible party. Now, who is the responsible party? Management. Management. Who said that over here? One of these guys. Oh, it was Joey. There you go, Joey. So our responsible party, let me write that in the right colour. Is management. About the evaluation or measurement of my subject matter. What's my subject matter? Oh, who said financial statements? Josh. Oh, see, that was lucky. Got good reflexes there. So our subject matter is our financial statements against some criteria. What are the criteria? Is it the same person at the <laughs> Oh, he's sharing his chocolate around. That's nice. Okay, I will it. Oh, here we go. Oh, all right. So our criteria are our AASBs because those are our guides um, or if for us, depending on where we are, of what the subject matter should look like. Right? They tell us how we calculate the numbers, what should go into the calculations, what note disclosures are. And so we've spent the entire semester working towards this, 
coming up with the opinion. And uh, we look at our opinions depending on Perry and Norman, who I heard you got introduced to last week. Um, if you don't know who Perry and Norman are, I will. I didn't know who Perry and Norman were until I got back from the conference. And Nelson told me about Perry and Norman. So we're responsible, we're focusing on financial report audits. So we're not interested terribly in environmental reports or prospectuses or half year uh, reviews. We're looking at the annual reports under ASA 200. Okay, and so you can see the information there. So ASA 200, we're giving reasonable assurance, not a guarantee because we can't look at everything. All right, the size of companies means we can't sample everything. And then we're making lots of decisions that require our judgment. This week in the quiz, we have to look at going concern. Well, how do I know if this is a material uncertainty or not? That requires some professional judgment. How do I know where to set my level of materiality? What mix of procedures? If I'm using um, judgmental sampling, I'm using a non-statistical method, how do I know if 50 or 25 or 70 is enough? And that's also one of the reasons why audit firms are paid a lot of money to do audits, because we can't test everything and we have to use our best professional judgment. So if we remember back to APES 110, we have some basic ethical principles. And this is one of the reasons why you can't bring a photocopied text into the exam. You can bring in anything you like, um, but you can't bring a photocopied text into the exam because our ethical principles for accountants, whether you're a CPA, a CA, or one of the members of the other professional bodies worldwide, says we must have integrity, objectivity, professional competence, confidentiality, and professional behavior. And having a valid textbook falls under our ability to have integrity, right? following the rules, not breaking the law. Objective, which we know, and we're going to discuss a little bit later, links a lot to our ideas of being independent. I can only give this audit opinion if I am objective and independent. I have to have professional competence, and competence is about having the right skills. We're learning those skills at a basic level here at university and then using those skills appropriately, exercising due care, taking care when we are doing our work. Oh yeah, the question bucket is still going around, so if you've got a question, you can pop it in the bucket and uh, I'll get to those at the end. Confidentiality, remember we get access to trade secrets and information before anybody else. And then acting in a professional manner. Oh, yep, keep passing the bucket around. If you've got a question, the bucket's coming around, you can take a bit of paper and write it on there. If not, you can keep it moving along. So what does it mean to act with professional behavior? Uh, part of that is some pretty standard things. You wouldn't insult your client. You'd always dress appropriately. Though PwC has made uh, headlines in the last week for saying we're getting rid of the dress code. You can wear whatever you like, but when you go to your clients, obviously you need to be reasonable. If you went to audit a surfwear company, they might be very casual, so you might dress appropriately. If you went to audit a Macquarie Bank, I'm pretty sure if you turned up in your shorts and t-shirts, they wouldn't be too impressed. So professional behavior, um, acting in a way that is befitting the profession. So we need to make sure that on all of our audits or our engagements, we are meeting these ethical principles and that we're thinking about them all the time. They're really a part of who we are. And this is what happens when students come to me and they say, look, Amanda, I just failed. I got 40. Can't you just give me 10 more marks? I say, well, hang on a second. I'm a CA. I'm a member of a professional body. Every other student that I've passed or has managed to pass the subject, I've done so following these ethical principles. And so when you ask me to do something like that, you're asking me to compromise my professional ethics, which unfortunately for you, I am not willing to do. Um, but, you know, you'd be more than welcome to come back again. There's, the jokes don't change, really. There's only so many auditing jokes that you can tell, so um, it gets less funny. So what sort of threats are there to independence out of APES 110? And this comes out of section 290. 
Uh, so we've got self-interest, the idea that if I own shares in perhaps a client that I'm auditing, I might be motivated to use information for my own needs. Self-review, checking my own work. This would be like if I gave you all your own exam to mark and you go tick, 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 100%. All right. Advocacy, we cannot act on the behalf of the client. Familiarity, this is friends, so certainly uh, we don't want to get too familiar because if our friends become our clients, then we may be more lenient or uh, a family member as well. So familiarity can come over time or it come, can come from an existing relationship. And there's the threat of intimidation where clients may say, if you don't give us this audit opinion, then we will do X. And hopefully you've not done anything wrong so that they can't say, oh, look, we're going to report you for this illegal behavior. Or they might say, we won't give you the audit next year. Now, if a client ever does say that, says, look, if you don't give us an unqualified opinion, I'm going to go to another auditor next year, you'd be like, fine. I'm just going to do the audit. I'm going to step away because when the client tries to negotiate like that, typically means they're hiding something more than what you've already found. So we certainly don't want to be associated with clients like that. So we have safeguards by the profession. They have all sorts of rules about who can audit what client. There's legislation in terms of the Corporations Act, which says things like, you know, there has to be an independence declaration. There are rules about independence within the Corporations Act um, and regulation. The clients will often enforce independence. They will say, look, we're going to have one firm do the audit and one firm do the consulting services, but different firms to minimize the self-interest and risk of self-review. And then the firms themselves have their own uh, specific requirements. But CA and CPA all say members must follow APES 110. Uh, and they, you're supposed to do regular training to keep up to date on ethical standards as well as current regulation. So what happens when things go wrong? There is the possibility that we could be exposed to legal liability because our audit report is a public document that can create legal exposure if we've done the wrong thing. All right. So if I've given an incorrect opinion, then I could be in some trouble. And that might be I've said that oh, look, financial statements are terrible, management are lying, you know, it's qualified, when in fact it maybe it should have been adverse. We could say it's unqualified when, in fact, it may need to have been qualified, or the opposite. Um, but there are multiple methods by which the auditor is exposed. Contract law under ASA 210, because remember, the auditor and the client sign a contract. Who can sue under the contract? What did somebody say over here? Yes, so only the parties who are part of the contract. Who are the two people that parties that sign the contract? The auditor and the company. Yeah. So could the shareholders sue under contract law? No, because you don't get every shareholder to sign the contract. And it might take a long time to get there if that was the, play, the case. The common law tort of negligence is where our third parties like our shareholders. And so our shareholders and our lenders will attempt to sue the auditor under the common law. And then the legislation, of course, you have the Corpse Act, and then you also have the Competition Consumer Act as well for misleading and deceptive conduct. Now, anybody can sue the auditor under the CCA for being misleading or deceptive. Generally, it's the ACCC that sort of brings uh, those cases against um, organizations. The Corporations Act, it's the company's auditors liquidation board that are the ones who pursue auditors who are doing the wrong thing here. But um, there's a news story and I'll send it out to you all via social media today where a liquidator is being pursued for failing to be independent under the Corporations Act. So they made decisions as a liquidator that would benefit them in the long term rather than benefiting the shareholders of the company. So you've got to be quite careful because the Corporations Act covers a wide range of areas. 
So key legal cases, London and General Bank established the idea of duty of care. I'm just going to have a drink. My leak-proof drink bottle is now leaking. I'm less than impressed. All right. So London and General uh, Bank was about the fact that the auditor owes a duty of care. And that was an extension of Donahue and Stevenson and the snail and the ginger beer bottle. Kingston Cotton Mill. Does anyone remember what this case is about? What's it about? Auditor's responsibility in what way? <coughs> Any ideas? It was about a certain animal. Cow. Was it a cow? No, Bernardo was... Good try, Bernardo. Not a cow. Watchdog. Who said watchdog? Yeah. So Kingston Cotton Mill was the idea that the auditor is a watchdog and they weren't a what? Bloodhound. Bloodhound, yep. All right, your forensic accountants are your bloodhounds. Pacific acceptance was one of the key cases that helped us actually design a lot of our basic auditing standards. So it said things like, you have to have a written report, you have to have a plan for the audit, you need to be independent, you need to have audit procedures, you need to gather evidence, you need to audit the whole year, you need to consider fraud. A lot of the basic principles around auditing standards that we take for granted now come out of some of these early cases where judges actually said these are the sorts of things that you need to do. And uh, back in 1970, and if you, do you guys know John Tyler, who teaches Accounting A? So I, I would often, students didn't know, I would often used to say Big John in the past, but I can't say Big John now because Big John has lost like half his body weight. So, you know, average size John says that um, when the auditing standards first came out, they were a thin little book. And now, of course, we can see the size of the auditing handbook. It's like the size of the telephone book. But uh, he tells a story about one night when he was a junior auditor and he had his auditing standards in the pocket of his jacket and uh, someone tried to attack him and, you know, tried to stab him and he was saved by the auditing handbook. Um, and he said, that wouldn't happen today because it's just way too thick to put in your jacket. He, tell, he, he promises me that is a true story. I'm not sure whether that's the case or not. But, uh, you know, auditing standards, critical lifeline for our auditors. Caparo from 1990 was a UK case and the UK case actually said, we need to think about the idea of proximity, but also, let me type this in here because I won't fit it in if I write it, reasonable foreseeability. So Kara said proximity, reasonableness and foreseeability in a three-prong test, but this was out of the UK. All right, but our most recent case is this one here, Asander in 1997. And you might think, wow, it's been almost 20 years and really not much has changed. But this is the current state of play for where the law is in Australia in terms of the tort of negligence. Because remember, this is all the tort of negligence. Uh, the tort says that for their third party to have a duty of care, the auditor has to owe them a duty of care, we have to know that the report was prepared going to that third party. So we have to know the report is going to shareholders. It's likely that they're going to rely upon it, that they risk suffering a loss, and that the auditor must encourage, entice, or induce that third party to rely as well. Let me add that one in there. So the auditor must encourage oops, comma, entice or induce reliance. All right, so that's a key there for the Asanda one. We have to encourage, entice or induce. So if you're a lender, the annual report doesn't say that. It doesn't say, dear lender, this is the report just for you. It says, dear shareholders, Please use this information for your decision-making purposes. And we encourage the shareholders to do so, but we do not encourage other third parties to do so. I'm just going to do a save. 
All right. So what happens when we take on a new contract? This is a bit like and, um, when I'm feeling really tired and I just want to watch something that's you know, not serious and hard hitting. So I don't want to scream at the TV watching Q&A or uh, Four Corners. And I'm sick of really watching you know, political debates that aren't really debates, they're just speeches. So I like to watch the show on SBS2 called If You Are The One. Has anybody seen that? It's this Chinese dating show where there are like 30 women, I think, standing around a one guy and they ask him questions and they turn their light on or off. So when we take on a new client, it's very much like that. We need to decide who do we want to accept. I don't want everybody as a client, just like if you're going to decide who to bring home to introduce to your parents, you're probably not going to bring home every single person you might meet at a club or a bar or at an event. So we want to be very careful. Guys, both of you. So we want to be careful and make sure that we assess them properly. So we want to think about, can we be independent? Are we suited to audit them? And then sign a formal contract in our engagement letter. And we need to consider the risk of being associated with that client. All right. You might not want to be associated with a client that could be involved in um, a number of, you know, exporting of uranium or, you know, I probably wouldn't be all that happy if I was auditing the client that ran um, asylum seeker detention centers offshore, which are pretty terrible places. Um, so what's the risk of being associated with auditing a company that might be doing something a little bit controversial? Um, and what effect could that have on your reputation or your ability to gain new clients? So you always need to think bigger picture. Firms tend to take what we call a portfolio approach All right, to selecting clients. So that means you'll have some risky clients, some medium risk clients, some low risk clients. And depending on your own risk profile, we know some people are bigger risk takers than others, um, you will balance your approach accordingly. <coughs> so what sort of stages are there of the audit? And this is just the same sort of diagram that we've had in our other lectures. I've just uh, reformatted a little bit so it's going across ways instead of down. We start out by assessing risk. All right, what color pen have I got here? Let's use black. So understanding the client. Anyone know what ASA or ISA understanding the client comes from? 315. All right, so we need to understand the client. It also says we need to think about the potential for risk. Okay. Then we also have to think about materiality, which I'm pretty sure is ASA 320. All right. Then we have to think about knowing, sort of in between here, we also have our audit strategy. And our audit strategy will tell us how much we're going to do in tests of controls and substantive testing. If we test our controls and we find out they're poor, we might need to change the level of substantive testing that we're doing here. All right. So it's all about being responsive and agile here, changing our plan if that's the case. All right. Oh, all the questions are done. Okay. Bevan, can I get you to turn around and you've got long arms. Ah, thank you. All right. So if you still want to ask a question, you can uh, come down and um, grab a piece of paper and put your question in the box. So we've looked at how we actually do our substantive testing. And you guys did some examples on testing internal controls and substantive testing and making conclusions. And there's some videos as well in the folders about how to do that. And then we come to the end where we have to assess going concern under ASA 570. We have to assess subsequent events under ASA 560. And then we have to come to our opinion under 700, 705, and 706. Now what's new as well is that we also now have to report under ASA 701 about our key audit matters, about talking about what things did the auditor have issues with, and here's how the auditor approached these tricky decision-making issues. Now, Nelson would have mentioned to you last week that in ASA 701, that does not come into effect until the 31st of December 2015, 
which, oh, sorry, 2016. Uh, let me use my eraser. Uh, 2016 here in Australia, which means we won't see anything about this until next year. Okay, some companies might, uh, there's the possibility that an audit firm might choose to early adopt these measures starting the reporting season, which is going to start in about two months. However, I'm not expecting it. I'm expecting audit firms to wait until the last minute possible to start making these extra disclosures that come with 701. Now, who's going into an audit vacation or audit grad job? A few people, right? And this is going to be a big key issue for, for those people who are going into a grad job or a vacation job relating to audit. Not so much early on in, in your career, but that's going to be a big part sort of later on. Now, we also looked at the possibility of fraud. Even though we know that Kingston Cotton Mill says that our job is to be a watchdog, I also have to consider the possibility of fraud. And I have two types of fraud. Let me just change the color of my pen here. We have theft of stuff, all right, which is misappropriation of assets. Oops, I can't spell today. Appropriation of assets. And then we have fictitious financial reporting, All right, which is misleading people in terms of uh, what's being said in the financial statement. So we've got those two types. Ah, thanks, Nelson. So I just had a question there about the theft bit here. So what happens if we do consider fraud? And if we do find the possibility of fraud, then you're absolutely spot on. The first thing that we need to do is we need to tell our managers but we also need to call our forensic specialists, right? Because forensic specialists are trained in searching for fraud. My, do my job is the job of a watchdog. I look for unusual stuff. But to sniff out the actual fraud, I need to call the bloodhound, okay? And the bloodhound is typically your forensic accounting team. And they will take a much deeper approach to searching for fraud than we will. They know how to comb through large sets of data instead of sampling transactions like we will. They will download whole data sets of journal entries and commissions from salespeople and run them through statistical programs to try and find perhaps is it a particular salesperson that is driving fraud, looking for patterns um, and methods to actually identify it. So forensics, certainly a big area. I've had a few students go into that over the last few years. And um, it does look really interesting. It's very different though from auditing, but you would call in a specialist. So ASA 240 says, we have these potential reasons for fraud. I've got an incentive or pressure, could be inside or outside the firm. You could be addicted to gambling. The rationalization, this idea that, oh, well look, you know, I've been underpaid for the last 10 years, so therefore I deserve to steal a whole lot of assets. You know, I've earned these. And then the opportunity to engage in fraud. Where, you know, I'm sure that everybody you know, has accidentally taken home a pen from work to use for personal reasons, then technically that is fraud. We're only interested in the material stuff, but um, the idea that nobody really checks, and this is what happens to mugs I've discovered in offices. You bring your own mug to the office to have tea or coffee and you think, well, my, my mug has my name on it. Everybody sees me drinking with my mug. Everyone should know this is my mug. So I'm going to wash it and put it in the dishwasher at the end of the night, and then hopefully the next day my mug should still be there. But because nobody really checks, suddenly one day your mug goes missing. And this is a true story. So uh, a very favorite mug of mine did go missing, and now somebody is holding it ransom. Uh, yes, and there's been sign, I've posted a sign within my uh, discipline area saying, you know, have you seen this mug? It's lost. And um, a little birdie sent me an anonymous email, anonymous message that said, you know, I know who has the mug and that they're holding the mug hostage. What are you going to pay for the mug? So now I'm waiting. But there is the possibility because of a lack of internal controls that there could be fraud right. that because nobody checks on something. We learned a lot about setting our audit strategy and using our audit risk model. 
And we know that we actually use the audit risk model in this format here, where we actually set the level that the partner sets the level of audit risk. We assess these from the client and then we come up with detection risk at the end and then that influences our type of audit strategy. All right? And if you haven't, who hasn't seen the YouTube videos on audit strategy yet? Great, so that means everyone's seen them. All right? And they move in opposite directions. But the key for you guys, the critical thing to be able to explain in an exam is why. Why does it move in an opposite direction? When control risk is low, what does that mean? And what does that have in terms of impact on how you're going to go about doing the audit? So the why and the explaining yourself is really, really critical. We also need to consider materiality under ASA 320. So the quantitative method is where we calculate a percentage of something. So it could be, for example, 5% of net profit. Or it could be... 0.5% of revenue. Now the reason that this percentage is so much smaller is obviously because generally revenue is a much bigger number and you take away your cogs. We need to think about qualitative factors, non-financial factors, some accounts that might be material simply because of their nature, like executive compensation, like related party transactions, like fraud. Fraud is qualitative no matter how big or small it is. All right. And then we have to consider the impact of risk on materiality. As risk goes up, materiality drops down to allow us to find more and more errors. And there's a good video there on YouTube to help you with that. So how do I identify the accounts that are at greater risk? Because remember, I'm taking a risk-based approach to audit. Where there are higher risks of misstatement, that's where I want to spend more time. All right. So which topic are you feeling least confident about going into the final exam? Any ideas? Assertions? All right. Some people might say subsequent events, if you've done the subsequent event stuff. Yes, I will talk about that, about references. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So if you thought subsequent events out of ASA 560 was the hardest topic this term so far for the final exam, then you would spend more time studying that than everything else. All right? And it's just like that in order. I want to spend more time where there's more risk of there being an error. So I need to look at plausible links between financial and non-financial data by doing analytical procedures. I look for fluctuations. I look for unusual ratios. I look for something that doesn't quite look right. And I do that early on in the risk assessment or in the planning phase. I might use it in the collecting evidence phase to help me estimate account balances or calculate inventory turnover per product line to find obsolete items. And then I do it again at the very end of the audit as my safety net, okay? Because if I find an unusual fluctuation up here, I go away and I do some auditing and I think I've eliminated the issue, then when I run the same analytic at the very end, whatever was bugging me before should disappear. And if it's still there, then that is my last chance to do something about it my last chance to go and investigate the possibility of more error. So what is an inherent risk? An inherent risk is something inherent in the industry, the firm structure, the uh, global business economy that is affecting the ability of that account to be correctly misstated. So mining firms, I always use the example of our uh, mining firms. Of course, for mining firms, it's not easy to value the natural resources in the ground for them, their asset valuation. And that's inherent in just the fact that that's what they do. If you're a company that makes mobile phones or something that has a lot of steps and does a lot of, uh, has a lot of cost pools and cost drivers in activity-based costing, the more complex the costing method, the greater the risk that you're gonna get, make a mistake there. Right? Companies that have high levels of foreign exchange 
in multiple currencies, uh, many transactions every single day, might have a greater risk at foreign currency translation reserve being incorrect. Now, how are they different from our business risks? Well, remember, our business risks are the risks that management must deal with. Right? What is stopping the objectives of the company from being achieved? Now, some of those things could overlap, but sometimes they're separate. If you're in a competitive industry, being in a competitive industry isn't necessarily going to affect the accounting, but it is going to affect how management make their choices about what to do. All right. And when we assess inherent risk, obviously, we use our low, medium, or high. All right. Low, you don't think there's much risk in the industry. High, you know, your mining firms are your high and then medium is in between. And again, this is judgment. So if you're asked to do this in an exam, the key is going to be answering the why and making sure that you can justify your decision. All right? Justifying your choice is really important. And this is where the team-based quizzes have become really important for you guys because you're always explaining to each other, oh no, but I think it's this for this particular reason. All right, so that's really critical. Hopefully from the team-based quizzes, it's not just about getting the right answer, but it's learning about why people are making their choices so that in an, in an exam, you can justify yourself, and that's critical. Why do you have to justify yourself? Because if you're an, ever an auditor and you're called up in a court case, then they are gonna say, Josh, why did you make that decision? You decided that, um, you calculated a projected misstatement greater than the tolerable level of materiality, why didn't you pursue that further? And if you haven't documented something, you're not going to remember five or seven years later. So it's really, really important that you make those justifications. We looked at internal controls, and we also looked at our pyramid. Remember this? Okay, ASA 315 says I must assess the design of the internal controls. I can't change the client's internal controls, but my control environment goes down here at the bottom. I look at how they assess risk. I look at how they minimize risk by implementing controls, of course, cost benefit. I look at their info systems, and then I look at how they monitor over the entire process. All right. And remember, without, if we don't have monitoring down here at the bottom, then I might not as well be doing anything here. Now, which companies have had issues around information systems over the last few days? Target. Not Target. There's another one. And it's because of an American service that's based here in Sydney. No. So there are a whole range of companies, I think Stan TV and Presto TV, which use something called Amazon Web Services which is Amazon's web hosting service, uh, which they have in the US and they have here, and a number of businesses that run their online platforms through Amazon Web Services went down over the weekend because of what freak event did we have? The storm. The storm. Yep, and uh, hopefully everybody's houses are safe and dry. Um, did everybody see on TV the story of that woman in Collaroy who's like, her whole backyard and the back of her house is just washed into the ocean. I'm not sure what your land value would be like there. Um, but we need to make sure that we have monitoring over our internal controls. Now, what should you be able to, uh, able to do? You should be able to identify any internal controls and you should be able to document them in a flowchart. You should be able to identify whether there are any weaknesses in the internal controls, and you should be able to make and justify a control risk assessment. And then based on that, decide on your audit strategy. All right. As well, if you can identify controls, you should also be able to design tests of those controls. All right, and when you sign up to the uh, daily study program that we've got going, you'll actually have lots of chances to practice that. All right, gathering evidence. 315 says we have to gather evidence 
but ASA 500 says I must collect sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay, now sufficient means volume, the how much question, of which we looked at sampling and said there's a whole range of factors that influence how much. Obviously, it's always safer to collect more than less. And then appropriate, which means using the right mix of audit procedures. Okay, remember we've got our nine procedures. So it's about making sure I've got the right mix of procedures for the assertion, for the transactions, or the account balance, or the disclosures. And we learnt how to document those by actually completing work papers. We looked at the assertions and how they fit together, so occurrence and existence are pretty similar. All right, you might notice completeness is the same. Accuracy and valuation go together. Classification and allocation, because they're about things in the right journal spot or the right balance sheet spot. And then cutoff and rights and obligations. So make sure that you can revise your assertions and you also know where to find them, which is in ASA 315124. Though I think that paragraph number might be wrong. I think it might be ASA 1, A128, but I would need to double check. So what about types of evidence? Our confirmations, and we've looked at, we've done examples of these confirmations, inspecting stuff, observing people, asking people, doing a calculations in Excel or on our calculator, vouching, which is starting at the end, going backwards, tracing, which is starting at the beginning, going forwards, and then analytics, all right? We also have re-performance, which is sort of like a combination. It's a little bit of a combination of uh, the vouching and the tracing at the same time. We know that we have sampling. We can't test everything, so we have sampling risk. The risk that my sample is not representative. Oops, representative. And therefore, if my sample isn't representative, I could be making the wrong conclusion. All right, and you saw we make some wrong conclusions the first week we did our sampling. And then we've got non-sampling risk, which is the possibility of our human error. You know, I might misinterpret some evidence um, and then I make a mistake. When we come to our sample sizes, there's two ways to calculate sample sizes, statistical, which you do not require, you are not required to have the calculation method, okay? So do not need to know how to calculate. All right, and then the non-statistical, which is the judgment. You choose to do 50, 70, etc. So we're not going to examine you on how to calculate sample sizes. But what I may ask you about is how would we choose the sample? Is it best to do random, interval, monetary unit, which is sort of a form of interval, judgmental, block, haphazard? Should I also consider the possibility of stratification, breaking my population up into groups? So you need to know which situations might be best for each of these, make your choice on sampling method, and know why you might stratify and then judgmental, why you might do random, why you might use interval, All right? And some things like block have specific purposes. If you're doing cutoff testing, which is usually the two weeks before and after the end of the financial year, you don't want to randomly select over the whole year. You want to select a block from a very specific period of time. All right, this is key though. What color am I doing here? That's why I put some little stars here. The key is evaluating your results. If my sample is representative of the population, then what can I conclude in terms of controls um, over here? So testing controls and of monetary errors. All right, so the one that you, most students usually focus on is this one here, projecting the monetary errors, um, calculating the projected error, and then more importantly, the question becomes, whoops, wrong thickness of pen. What does the auditor do next? Does the auditor need to do more testing? 
Does the auditor need to do a different test, gather evidence from a different place, look at a different assertion, look into a control, change our audit strategy? Bevan. Shh. Now all the people who watch the video on YouTube will be like, who's this Bevan guy talking? So what do I consider when I select my sample? Um, I set my control and my inherent risk. I know what my planning materiality is. And this is key, so I'm going to highlight the bits that are critical for you guys. What's the right population? You did some tests about selecting the right population last week. Um, think about whether you should stratify your sample. And then design some procedures. All right, so you've been asked to design a little bit before. This is a key exam question. So this is something that I always ask in exams. Um, because I think it's really critical. All right. How do I design a procedure? You need to make sure that you check all of the assertions. If you're auditing a transaction, don't just audit two of the assertions, audit all of them. Um, and then write your tests following my four rules. And these four rules are the same four rules that, we, that I developed in practice that we use here. Use the right technical name. Show me that you're a professional, that you know how to be part of a profession. Use the client-specific terms for documents. If you get given a case, use the client-specific information in that case. Be as detailed as possible. Someone should be able to follow your exact instructions and know what to do. And then make sure it's testing the correct thing. If I'm testing controls, is it testing the control? Or if I'm testing substantively, am I gathering evidence <coughs> on the correct assertion? When you have to do a procedure like this in the exam, I am looking for all four of these things to get the marks. All right, the drill. Be as detailed as possible. It needs to tell me every step. Gather this document and this document. Check the price on the first document to the price list on the second document. And then recalculate the total of the invoice or each line item. So in the examples that I've given you in class to do, those, the substantive testing example and the control testing example, those are ones where we have detailed instructions. You'll also have the opportunity to design procedures um, in the audit study program in which when you've designed examples, I will give feedback like there's not, as much, there's not enough detail or good use of client specific terms but you haven't told me the technical name of exactly what you're doing. All right. So you will get ample opportunities for feedback on your study around this in the study program. Now, the study program isn't compulsory. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. It is completely voluntary. Oh, now, for the areas we've examined, and we've sort of, you know, we've discussed sales and we've discussed accounts payable. Um, in the study program, we're going to go into some more detail if you choose to, how sales processes work, how purchasing processes work. We've seen some examples of those, but you need to be able to identify risks and assertions, design tests of controls, and design substantive procedures. And the study program gives you that practice if you want to do that. So wrapping up the audit, uh, let me put a different color pen on here. All right, so going concern is ASA what? 570, yep, hang on, somebody up here said 570, oh, that was lucky, see, this is why I'm an, uh, I'm an auditor and not a sports person for a living. Uh, subsequent events is ASA, 560, oh, see, this is terrible, can you reach or do I need to send a rescue party? Oops, and I can't even, 576. There's no audit opinion for auditing standard 576. And then our audit opinions, as I've mentioned before, come out of ASA 700, 705, and 706. All right, now 706 is about emphasis of matter paragraphs, remember. Okay. So going concern, we have to consider whether the company will continue, and obviously we've got this little rocky diagram here because it looks a little bit treacherous for the organization. 
Remember to look at that flow diagram that's in the back of the most recent version of ASA 570, and I sent that out over social media this week. ASA 560, now in an exam, in my worked examples for ASA 560, you will always see me draw these little timelines. And I will say, oh, I discovered the event here, but it relates to something back there, okay? When it comes to subsequent events, the key is knowing when it was discovered versus when it, would, when it occurred, knowing whether it's adjusting or non-adjusting, and then figuring out what our responsibilities are in ASA 560. In the worked example on YouTube, I draw a timeline that shows how to work through subsequent event problems. If you draw the timeline in an exam, you should never go wrong. All right, and you put your little X's in the right spots and you follow the uh, methodology I've developed on here, then you shouldn't run into any issues, okay? If you have trouble with subsequent events, then uh, please make sure you go through those videos. And if you want to do any of the subsequent event questions out of the textbook, I'll see if I can get the answers made available to you so you can have some practice. We know about our different audit opinions, unmodified, also sometimes called the unqualified opinion. So while technically unmodified is okay, the most common business vernacular is the unqualified opinion. And then you've got the modifications over here. And then the emphasis of matter paragraph and other matters that can be added to any of these. So it can go onto this one or it can go onto this one here. Now this table comes out of ASA 705. Um, and if you're, you're printing out some standards to bring into the exam, ASA 705 is definitely one of those I would think about printing. And then I would also put a little tab or something to find this table, right? Because remember, this tells us what reasons why there might be a modification. We disagree with management about a number or we can't get efficient evidence. So, and as Nelson introduced you to Perry last week, Perry the pervasive octopus, and I've used the octopus example for a number of years, but uh, Nelson said we should name the octopus after all these years. So Perry is pervasive, all right? And we've got, I think, Norman, the non-pervasive. Is it Norman? Norman, the non-pervasive slug. So, you know, he's slow and he's contained to one area of the finite. Well, it could be a sheep, but, you know, we have to... I'm going to assume Norman's a boy here. Um, so if he's... Within one set of the financial statements and management don't agree, we go with qualified. If it's a situation like Percy, sorry, Perry, I always get Perry, Percy, you know, I should remember Perry, the pervasive octopus, then we're going to go with adverse, all right? Here, when we can't get enough information, in the Norman situation, it's qualified, and in the Perry situation, it's disclaimer. Disclaimer is, I'm not even gonna give an opinion. Right? This is the opinion that is not an opinion. I'm just saying I'm not giving an opinion. So that's why it says disclaimer there. Whereas the other ones, this, this, and these are actual opinions of we think this is correct or not correct. Here it's like, I can't even get enough information to make an opinion about correctness or not correct. All right, exam info. Um, I'm going to release a whole stack of exam info on Friday, but... What I can tell you, just like it would be similar to the questions that we had in today's quiz. Okay, everyone's oh my God, if you haven't been to the quiz today, well then have fun. Um, if you have been to the quiz today, you'll know what I'm talking about. But our questions are combinatory. All right, so it's not like a week four question and a week 10 question and a week seven question. I make my questions and I combine all of the weeks together to do certain tasks in the audit. So your exam will be like doing tasks on an audit, okay? So practical application, but knowing why you need to do something and justifying why you're making your choices is going to be critical. About one third of the marks in this exam, one third to maybe one quarter, go to being correct, having the right answer. The rest of the marks go towards explaining why your answer is the best answer. All right, so that is really, really critical. Not just what is the answer, but why is that the answer? So, some last thoughts before I get onto the box. 
Um, and this is, this is my chance, because you guys are like a captive audience for the next 10 minutes, at least before, before our time runs out. So I've been around for a very long time. And uh, while some people might think Nelson is slightly older than me, he's not. Um, and so I started at UTS as a student in 1997. So next year it will be my 20th anniversary at UTS in some capacity. And you know that I started out in a big four audit firm in a sort of commercial <coughs> type career. And so you might think, well, you know, how did you get here to this? Why aren't you a partner at a big four firm? Or why aren't you, you know, doing some fancy CEO thing or, or something else like that? And that comes down to a few different reasons. But the key one is this. Oops. All right. I loved working at a big four firm. I loved the people that I worked with. Um, but for some reason, even though I was making lots of really good money, and I took a pay cut to come here to UTS, a pretty big pay cut, um, what I found is that I wasn't happy. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't happy. All right. And I went to, and I just happened to be at a conference where uh, the key speaker was Tal Ben Shaher, who ran the most popular course ever at Harvard University. It was a psychology course on being happy. And so he talked about what are the keys to happiness. And some of the things that he talked about were these. Pursue something that is your passion. All right? And I love teaching. I didn't think I'd like teaching, but I've discovered I really love teaching and I love students seeing the aha moment and working with each other and my teaching philosophy has changed a lot over time. But in 15 years, and this year I'm about to receive the, the faculty of the UTS Business School's Lecturer um, of the Year Award, and, uh, which is next week. So if you're going to prize night, I will see you there at prize night. But for many, many years, my dedication and passion as a teacher was recognized by students, but not by the university. And then in the last three years, and I've been just you know, quietly chugging away on being a great teacher and helping my colleagues become great educators and giving my students great educational experiences. Suddenly now, teaching has become a very important skill valued by the university. And in that time, in the last three years, I've developed strategy for how the university runs in terms of teaching. Not the 10-week thing, that's not, my, that's not me. Um, I've been involved in introducing technology and the lecture things. So I was recording lectures and bringing like a whole suitcase full of equipment to record lectures for my students four years ago. And people thought, that's ridiculous. No one is ever going to come if you record your lectures. But I look around and like this is pretty much the same number of people we have every week. So if you make the lecture great and you have a great teacher, that's not going to stop students from coming to class. And to the point where, you know, the sorts of collaborative stuff you're doing at university, I'm really at the edge. It's probably very different. But suddenly now I've had three invitations to speak at conferences about what we're doing and to try and encourage other academics to do the same. So while you might not think that the path you're on is very popular right now, if you're following your passion, eventually someone will recognize what a great job you're doing. So passion was the key. The other thing was this one. And I realized while I loved earning a lot of money, I didn't get any of that good feeling of helping other people in my job, right? Because it was audits. And as much as I'm you know, legally helping big financial companies, I didn't feel like I was doing anything that was really helping people. And now I think in this job, and from the students I see at graduation and the students that I keep in touch with, you know, a big part of I've discovered what makes me happy and what makes people in ha happy generally is doing something to help someone else. And that could be as simple as when you bake some cookies at home, you take some to an elderly neighbor, all right? Or you pull out someone's rubbish bin or someone stumbles in the street and you help them up, all right? So what I recommend to everybody, and I know we're all here in accounting, 
because we're looking at business careers, but figure out some way that you can turn your passion into your career. All right? To the point where, and this is the job I love so much, that even if I won lotto, this is still the job I'd come to. I probably wouldn't do any of the admin crap that goes with this job. I'd pay someone else to do that. But I'd still do the educating bit because that's the bit I love about this job. All right? And find some way to help others in the skills that you have. That could be volunteering your accounting skills for a charity, just sort of what I'm doing with Got a Pen, um, or helping out a neighbor. For my son, when we have Christmas, you know, advent calendars where you have the 12 days of Christmas, we have a thing called the kindness elves where every day he gets a little letter and the letter gives him an idea of something we could do to help other people. So we make cookies to, we have a nursing home right near us, so we make cookies to go to a nursing home. I have some elderly neighbors who, you know, have trouble doing their gardens, that sort of thing. So one of those tasks is that once every couple of weeks we go out and we mow, mow their lawn. So it's about giving back to the wider community. And I really think that, you know, while we might think the world is in a pretty dire place with some of the thoughts people might have about how we treat others, if we treat everybody with compassion and humanity, then I think we've got a really good chance of coming out of the current sort of tumultuous period intact and better than before. And I've, people say, look, the generation, you guys, lazy, interested in themselves, right? Live at home forever with their parents. But what I've seen when I've interacted with you guys is the complete opposite. I've seen students who are really taking charge and ownership of their studies and wanting to do great things after they leave university. So take that passion and I want you to keep going with that for the rest of your career. And that's all my advice. So good luck to everybody. I will go through the box of things, but for the video, good luck and I will see you at graduation. Obviously this is Audit Junior here when he was a little, little bobber. Um, and coming up to the main exam, you'll see lots of stuff from him, messages from him um, about what he thinks you should do in regards to the exam. Question number one, what are the exceptions to adjusting balances when events occur after the end of the financial year? So this is a subsequent event question. I would say that you would adjust balances when events occur after the financial year when the originating transaction starts in the financial period. So the most common example is your accounts receivable. Customer goes bankrupt after the end of the financial year, but they owed a debt at the 30th of June, then adjustment. All right, there's one on the back. Are you going to mark strictly in the final exam? <laughs> Don't fail me. Now here's where, you know, I know student, everybody's feeling a bit nervous, but you shouldn't be. Right? Students always really surprise themselves in audit. I'm going to mark exactly how I've told you I'm going to mark. The things that I'm looking for, I'm looking for explanations. I'm going to look for references to things. So instead of saying to me, don't mark strict, I'm going to say to you guys, write fabulous responses in the exam. Oh, what's in the final exam in the sad frog? That's a pretty good drawing of the sad frog there. Um, I will tell you probably on Thursday or Friday. There'll be a video that comes out on Thursday or Friday with the information on the exam. Can you explain the assertions again, which we did in the lecture? Can we have an extra week of auditing? Of course. I, I will just, you know, ask the, the powers that be to do that. How am I doing? I am really tired. But thank you very much for asking. Oh. Will you be having consultation times after this week? Yes. So we will have some two hour blocks where we'll actually book out a classroom. And during that time, in that two hours, if you don't have a question, you can just come by and hang out in the room and hear the questions that other people are asking and then jump in if you like. So that's, there'll be other ones. And I'll put the times and the room locations up. Any advice to get into the auditing industry? Um, so my key would be if you're able to do an internship, because most grad jobs come from vacation or intern jobs. If, for example, you're an international student trying to get an internship doesn't quite work out, then um, 
the best thing to do would be to build some experience, even if it's in basic accounting and then look at moving into auditing a little bit later on. Um, sometimes I get requests for people to apply for auditing jobs. And when I do, I put those out through my Facebook page, through the Amanda Loves to Audit page. Um, so if you're ever you know, keeping up to date uh, on my page, then any ads that come out, because sometimes people recruit directly through me, those will go up there as well. Oh, there's a lot of questions in here. What's the format of answering an exam type short answer question? The key to answering any short answer question is to answer the actual question. Right? Now, I'm, not, I'm serious. People, you see a key word like inherent risk and then they just start writing. Like everything I can remember about inherent risk is blah, 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 verbal diarrhea. The problem is that that often isn't answering the question. I might say explain X in relation to Y and then students just start rambling. And I only give you a limited amount of space. I give you actual lines to write on, 10 lines or 8 lines or 6 lines. And so a longer response, like 10 lines, requires more, has more marks and requires more explanation than a box that has three lines, right? But you need to be able to answer the exact question. So if I ask, why is the sky blue and you're telling me about why the grass is green, even though it might be correct, I can't give you anything. So the key is answering the question directly. You don't need to give me a definition for something. If I ask you to explain how something works, I know in high school often, or in other subjects, it says, start with the definition and then move on to your explanation. Don't waste the space on a definition. Just go straight into the actual answer. Because um, I know the definition. You don't need to tell me. And you've got your book. All right. 11 weeks later and still no Snapchat. Oh, no, I am on Snapchat now. So um, I am on Snapchat, whoever this is. I wonder if that is Michael here. I think he asked me about Snapchat a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I am on Snapchat now, and I will figure out how to tell you how I'm on Snapchat. I will get somebody in one of my other classes <laughs> to show me how to do it, because they had to. I downloaded it, and then they had to show me what to do, because I felt like such an old person that I didn't know what was going on. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to use Snapchat to help you, but I will try. Uh, you might just get funny pictures of Audit Junior with all the weird faces because that's all he asked for Snapchat and that's what it's about. Oh, uh, is the final exam assessing the whole process of audit? Yes. Uh, no multiple questions, multiple choice. I'm not sure what that means, multiple choice questions. No multiple choice, all written, and it's like doing a real audit. All right, so like doing a real audit. Oh my God, there's still heaps. How to quickly, uh, we've correctly answer a question, we've talked about that one, that one's blank. Can we please have a list of all the necessary standards? Yes. I will give you a summary of which standards I think are key that you might need to print out and bring with you to the exam, that's a good one. What to study for the final everything. <laughs> Can we please have a breakdown of the exam paper and types of, and topics uh, covered? I'll give you a breakdown, but I'm not going to give you the specific questions because even if I sort of give you descriptions of the questions, it's not actually going to help you. So study everything. Uh, any more? That's blanks. All right. So that's it for our term. Thank you, everybody. If you didn't get a sticker, please come down and grab one. And if you have anything for the... Uh, Thank you, everybody. If you have anything for the donation box, pop it in there. But we'll be connected, collecting donations for the rest of term. Absolutely.